Hey guys, Toby Mathis here with Infinity Investing, and today we're going to talk about real estate syndications. So let's hop right on in. First off, please like and subscribe. I'd like to know how many people are out there watching these. But let's dive into the topic at hand of this real estate syndication, what it is, what type of terms I should be looking for, what's fairly common, etc. So I'll tell you, I'm a tax attorney. So the first thing we do is when we look at a syndication, it's a fancy way of saying a non-publicly traded security. So I have an exception, usually it's Reg D, and I have this 504, 506, you're gonna see all these different terms. What it really says is, hey, I'm selling this to people, not on a public market, without all those disclosures and those costs that go along with it. I am basically raising private money underneath the realm of here's the ex exceptions, here's how much I can raise, here's the type of people I can sell to, usually it's accredited investors, and accredited investors under the SEC, if you have a net worth of a million dollars, not including your house. So outside of your house, you have a net worth of a million dollars, you're an accredited investor. Or if you're single and you make $200,000 a year, you've been doing that for, I think it's for two years and you plan on keep doing it, you'll be an accredited investor. Or if you're married filing jointly and you make $300,000 a year, you've been doing that for a couple of years and you keep on and you're gonna keep doing it, you'll be an accredited investor. What that's doing is it's saying, hey, you're not peddling it out to the market as a whole. You're not peddling it to people that can't afford to lose money. You're dealing with people that have a higher sophistication. All right, so that's number one. It's a non-publicly traded security. It's underneath an exception, which all the registration and disclosure rules are no longer. You're just following underneath this thing called a Reg D, and you have to follow those rules, which usually requires a memorandum, private placement memorandum to an accredited investor, you're signing off on these things. So you have somebody acknowledging that you are, that the individual that is looking at the investment is accredited. Number one, you're going to have to sign off on something that says like I'm an accredited investor. You're going to have to have a CPA attorney write a letter, or you're going to go to a website like verify.com and you're going to get that to the syndicator who's going to say, I am going to share with you this business opportunity so long as you meet these requirements. Now, there are syndications that will have a small number, usually 35 or less, of non-accredited investors. I'm not a big fan of those. Just say that right now because that's usually asking for, for trouble. So usually you're an accredited investor and you want syndications, offerings, groups, of like here's an investment offer and it's only available to people like you because otherwise you're going to have some problems because folks that are not accredited, usually the ones that get into a little bit of trouble when if something doesn't happen the way that they're hoping or if they need liquidity, they need to be able to get that back because all of a sudden they have a life event and all of a sudden they need $25,000 back. It can cause a problem for the whole syndication. So we're dealing with accredited investors and we're proposing an investment. And usually it's an LLC or a limited partnership and the syndicator is part of a management group. So usually you have the actual investment fund, call that company A, and they're offering you to put in money to company A. Company B is managing company A. Company B is the syndicator and they have a percentage of the investment. You, sometimes they'll carve off and say, hey, we get 20%. So we're gonna get 20% of the growth and we're gonna charge you to manage the investment. So imagine, imagine that you're going in and you're buying an apartment complex. So they identify an apartment complex. They put it under contract. And usually there's two ways. Either they own the real estate already or they're taking down a deal. So they've got it under contract. Let's say that it's a $5 million apartment. They arrange financing and they need to raise $1 million to get the down payment. And so they go to their group saying, you guys can participate in this. You can own X percentage of the total deal. And here's how much it is per unit. So they'll say, you know, we're going to sell 100 units at X number of dollars. So they're going to raise a million dollars, 100 units. What is that? $10,000 a unit or something like that. And they say, this is what we are going to do. We are going to use that money and we are going to get a loan for the remaining 4 million or whatever it is. And we're going to improve it. Uh, or like, you know, that includes the cost of improving it, et cetera. Like maybe they're going to buy it and improve it and they're going to manage it with the idea that once they're done, because they're increasing the cash flow on it, they are increasing the value of that property. 
uh, as a result. So they're going to fix it up, raise rents, sell it. So let's say they say four to five year period. Usually what you're doing is you're buying units. You're not in control. You're completely passive. They, and then the syndicator is going to be looking at giving incentives to get you to invest. And what kind of incentives? They may say preferred return. The first 7% of any cash flows or whatever it is, X percent, goes to this group of investors that bought into company, you know, whatever it is, the, the company that, that holds the investment. The management company is getting paid a piece of, you know, a set fee. Maybe they're charging a percentage, 10% to manage, plus they own 20% of the shares. And they say, hey, we're secondary. We're class B shares or class A shares, depending on how you do it. But you're a different class of shares and we're getting paid after you as the investor. So the investor says, okay, I'm a little more comfortable with this, that this just isn't a money grab for the syndicator, but I'm going to be getting paid. If as long as it's making money, I'm getting paid first, right? So they may say a preferred return. And then they might say, hey, you are going to get 80% of any increases, 20% is carved out for the management, plus we own a piece. Like that could be too, they call it like a waterfall. So hey, if we make a target, so we're going to buy it and improve it for 5 million and we're going to sell it for 10. So we have a $5 million profit. We get a million of that because we manage the whole thing. We get a million of that first off. The 4 million, you're going to get as an investor, you're 80% of that, right? So um, if, if I sold 80% of the deal to the class, let's say it's the class A investors, us, and we have a preferred return, we get all that, and we always get, get everybody gets made whole, everything gets equaled out, and then we have this much profit, then I get a, the syndicator is going to say, I want a piece of whatever that growth is, plus I am, plus they're also shareholders or uh, members as well, and they're going to get their share. So you're going to get 80% of the 80%. You know, like you have to do the math on it and you have to look at it. Not every syndicator does that, right? The numbers are going to be all over the place. That's why you want to nail them down in that private placement memorandum and say, A, do I get a preferred rate of return or are we just kind of uh, playing around here? Are we, are we going to get money distributed? Like is it the is is the document saying, hey, we're going to we're going to distribute cash flow beyond our ordinary needs? Uh, on a quarterly basis? How do we define the ordinary needs? What are the projections? You're going to be looking at all these things and you're rolling the dice, right? Hey, I'm, I'm going to be playing a, hey, I'm hoping that because I'm taking on something risky, there's going to be a bigger reward. How do you know whether you're going to get the reward, right? How do you know what that reward is going to be? That's where you start seeing syndicators that have past deals and you start talking to the investors there and see, you know, what was the payout? Did they do what they said they're going to do? Did they, were they overly optimistic in their projections or, or did they exceed them? And then you start looking and see why there's certain syndicators that have a waiting list, right? There's certain groups where the second they offer, they, everybody's like, I, I know this, this is exactly what they do. They may take a little piece, but I'm fine with it because every time I give them a dollar, two years later, they give me back three, right? So that's why these documents exist. And that's why syndicators, like once you get a good name as a syndicator, you get these big groups that, hey, want to deal with you. So here comes a new syndicator and they have to compete with somebody with a track record, right? The track record, people are jacking up the amount that they're taking in their waterfall. Maybe they're taking a higher management fee, et cetera. And the newbie has to come out there and make it very attractive for someone to invest in it. So quite often they're going to have things that they already own that they add in and sweeten the deal. So for example, you may go into a syndication and you're buying company A and company A is developing a product or, or, or something that they're going to take to market. And they say, hey, what are you going to own as the investor? And it's going to be the intellectual property and in company A, but they may say, hey, we also have company B that's already revenue producing and we're going to toss in half of company B. And you're going to buy company A and you know what you're getting. They're giving you a little sweetener because they don't have that track record and they want you to invest in it. Here's another example, pre-IPO. Whenever you hear pre-IPO, somebody's doing raising money in the private markets and they're going to go public. That is syndications. Like they are, somebody's buying an interest in that company. It is not public yet, 
quite often an investment banker will go out and buy a bunch of shares. Let's say that I'm, you know, ABC, I'm buying a Epic Games is one that just popped up. Like it's really hard to come by. Let's say you get some Epic Games, right? Most folks, like if, if I am a uh, private investor and I'm, uh, and I'm able to get in and get some of those shares, I may sl- pop that into a syndication and say, hey, if you want to buy into my fund, we hold these shares. And uh, you might mark up the shares. Usually they're going to mark that up 20%, 30%, 40%, whatever the, whatever they, the, the market will bear. And you are owning company A that owns company B. And I might say the payout is we just give you the shares of company B. We usually, usually there's a carrying cost. They're going to take a piece of the, uh, of the investment and they may be charging you on an annual basis. That's just typical when you're doing these types of things, right? But there's a company that is being purchased by a fund and the fund is what's being marketed to the individual investors. No different than I buy the real estate, the real estate goes into the fund and that is what I'm marketing that to the individual investor. Here's this great building I have under contract. Here's what we plan to do with it. How does the syndicator make money then? And that's kind of the the, the, the $10,000 question, the $100,000 question is you're always looking at it saying, how are they getting paid? And you'll see that most folks that are just doing this, they're just putting deals together. Usually they're getting paid out of the profit. Usually they're going to say, I will allow you in this. We believe this is going to go from A, you know, or X dollars to Z dollars. And we're going to take 20% of the difference between those or 30% or 40% or 50%, depending on the syndication, right? There's that way. And a lot of syndicators, the case, they're just making the, their money because they're putting the deal together. If you're in real estate, chances are that syndicator is going to say, we are going to make money as the manager. We're going to manage the deal. And we're also going to get paid a fee for that. You want to nail down what is that fee? How do we know how much you're getting paid? So it may be a net re- you know, a net profit percentage, or it may be a set dollar amount. Hey, we are going to manage this, or we're going to be a property manager. We're going to charge 8%. Right. And so they're making their money as a property manager and they're going to take a piece of the uh, of the of the profit. Hey, we're going to manage the thing, which you're going to pay us normally, like we would pay any other third party property manager. But we happen to have the property management company. And when we sell this thing, when we exit, we are going to get a, you know, a a, a piece of the growth, 10 percent, 20 percent, 30 percent of the growth. Right. Whatever it is. That's what you're negotiating with. And you're looking and saying, how are you getting paid? There are a lot of really great, like I have clients that are syndicators. I've worked with a ton of them. It is really fun when you see these folks get good at their syndications and they're getting great returns for their investors. And the next thing you know, the investors are always like, let me know when there's another one. Count me in. They pick up the phone. I have another one. Great. Allocate X dollars. Like they don't even have to see it. They know the syndicator because the syndicator is a trusted uh, group now or a trusted individual. They're doing the same thing over and over again. The apartment syndicators is like, once you get that dialed in, I got Maureen, I won't mention her last name, but Maureen's one of my clients, just fantastic at it. She has it dialed in because they make their money in the construction, the property management, things like that. She's going to make money regardless. She gives great returns to the investors. So they follow her around. Then there's groups that are in real estate that may be saying, hey, let's go do mobile home parks and things like that, right? They know syndicator, hey, they're already going to make money because they have their business that manages it. And we happen to know that area and we have built-in clientele that's going to want to acquire it anyway, in which case, yeah, then they're probably going to take a percentage. Uh, Not only are they going to manage it, but they're going to be an owner, plus they're going to take a percentage of the growth. That is not uncommon. As they get really good at it, you see those interest rates, like the amount that they're taking grow, because obviously you're saying, hey, I know, like I have this thing dialed in, I have it down to a formula, we're getting these great returns, and some of them split it with individuals. I know groups that do like the medical offices, for example, uh, and they have that niche, and they know the numbers so well that they'll take 50% of any of the growth, and people are still throwing money in because they know that these guys know what they're doing and get the returns that they project. So if they project a return, they know that they're going to exceed it, hit it or exceed it. Uh, Another great one that we work with uh, does uh, self-storage in RV parks and things like that. And they've been doing so many of them 
and they have it so dialed in, they have the technology that they immediately wrap on these things that you could say, here's old school way of doing it. But if we convert it to our way of doing it, we're going to increase the revenue by X in the way cap rates works. That's going to increase the value by Y, which is this big dollar amount. So all we have to do is buy old technology, old technology, put our new technology on it, sell it. Old technology, put new technology on it, sell it. And I think could pretty much dial in and tell you exactly what the dollar amount is going to be. Because you, we get, we're get, we going to uncover brand new cash with the efficiencies. That's how syndications work. You as the individual who's investing in them, it's all written. It's all covered by the contract and the agreement that you sign. Here's the private placement. Here's what we're going to do. And you're going to say, like, are there going to be periodic payments? How much of the of the revenue is going to be paid out? Am I getting a return of my capital? Is that what it is? Because, hey, I get that back tax free. Is, 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 am I being paid a preferred amount of whatever the revenue that's coming in is? Like, those are the things that I'm looking at. When do I get my money back? How am I going to be treated? How much are you going to get paid? And those things are all covered underneath that private placement memorandum. And that's what you're having that discussion on. When you receive it, just so you know, you are not a material participant. So it's always going to be passive, but it is going to maintain its character uh, of the revenue that comes out. But you're not going to be a, uh, a non-passive participant in this, uh, barring uh, odd circumstances. You're usually sitting back. So how does that affect things like real estate, professional status? That's why you group activities. When you group activities, then it doesn't matter. Hey, all my real estate's treated as one. So if I'm a real estate professional, so long as I meet certain requirements, then I'm, um, then it's not going to affect it. It's still going to be just wrapped into your real estate. It unlocks it and makes it non-passive because it's rental real estate unlocked. Boom. If I'm in a business and it's an active business, then I'm going to have passive uh, uh, income or passive loss that's coming in. And again, your tax advisor is going to show you what what things can offset it. I'm a tax attorney. So I tend to look at those things going, oh, this is good because we have a whole bunch of loss over here from this activity. We can use that to offset this type of income if it's, if it's passive. So those are the things that we're looking at. Hopefully that illuminates uh, private placements a little bit for you, gives you a better idea of, of, of how they operate and the things to be looking at and why that private placement memorandum is so critical because it's going to detail all these considerations. If you like this type of information, like and subscribe, please, and share it with whomever you think would benefit from this information.